Hey everybody, my name is Derek Kilmer and I represent Washington 6th Congressional District and today we're reading 123 Salish Sea, which is written and illustrated by Washington's own Nikki McClure. It's a counting book. All right, here we go. One, one stubby squid exploring below. Two, two banana slugs intertwined. Definitely seen that on a rainy day. Three, three lump suckers hanging on. And four, four moon jellies drifting about. Five, five salmon swimming home. Six, six nudibranchs dancing all night. And seven, seven seals mapping all day. Eight, eight kelp crabs lunching in a forest. Nine, nine orcas hunting together. I got a tenth one over my shoulder there. Hello, my name is Sarah Pate, and I'm a librarian at the Washington State Library, and I'm the co-manager of the Washington Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book. And I'm Linda Johns. I'm a librarian at the Seattle Public Library and the co-manager with Sarah of the Washington Center for the Book. The Washington Center for the Book promotes literacy and a love of books, reading, and libraries. We celebrate Washington's robust literary heritage and shine a spotlight on the contribution of reading and libraries in strengthening communities and in fostering civic engagement. All three of us today are physically recording this event on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people on or near the shores of the Salish Sea. The Salish Sea is one of the largest inland seas in the world. The sea is named in honor of the Coast Salish peoples who have cared for the water and land since time immemorial. Read Around the States is one of our projects with the Library of Congress, and we are thrilled to be speaking to Washington author Nikki McClure today. Representative Kilmer chose to read Nikki's beautiful book, 123 Salish Sea, as an example of the brilliant work of Washington authors. Nikki McClure has lived in Washington her whole life, always near the Salish Sea, where she is today. She has written and illustrated many books, including 123 Salish Sea, To Market to Market, and Waiting for High Tide, to name just a few. She lives in Olympia with her family in a forest of cedar trees. Thank you so much for being with us today, Nikki. Well, thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, where you are today and why you chose this and um, the sea and the connection with your book? Sure, um, I'm on the northeast, I always want to say northwest, but northeast side of Bud Inlet and here just north of Olympia and this is the beach that I live on and there's my son's boat out there and the herons on it. And I actually come down here a lot to work and I would come down here and I did a lot of my early sketches for the book just down on the beach. Um, as the tide come up, I kind of scoot up further like a crab and I'd do a lot of work down outside as much as possible. Can you tell us what libraries mean to you? What part they've played in your life and in your work? Well, I was always the kid that um, went and hung out in the corner of my school library and I would draw during every recess and I would play these drawing games with my best friend where you just draw a squiggle and then you pass the paper over and they have to turn something, that squiggle into something and then you draw, they draw a squiggle and you have to turn it into something. And I can remember like, you know, they just, I could draw you a map of that library, you know, like, and where, where you could go get little women over on that side and then you could go all the way across over to like the science books over on this side. And um, so that was a big part of it. Um, I also, we moved a lot as a kid. We would, every year we would move to a cheaper place to live renting and my mom was a single mom. And I remember um, each time we moved, there would be the trunk load of books that needed to be returned to the library. <laughs> um, 
because they had gone lost in the mess of three kids. And we, you know, always sort of ashamedly bringing back these totally, totally overdue books, but they were really necessary um, sources of information, especially back in those days um, for me, because we couldn't afford to buy books. So the library was there. And I could also draw you a picture of my library in Kirkland as well, even though it's been remodeled. Um, and then currently, um, you know, as a parent, um, going to library story time with my kid was um, in the Olympia Library has always just, you know, there's just some moments there that I'll never forget because <laughs> those kids would just do crazy things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I actually have a video I have to return today to the library. It's overdue. So, <laughs> well, I know that you've made a lot of memories for folks at the Olympia Timberland Library too with um, all the projects and programs you've done there for, um, you know, so many of your books. Oh yeah, and then, then my husband too built the library. There's a reading van that kids can go and hop in. Uh, bookmobile that's inside the kids section of the library and he, he built that. And so that's really special. If you're ever in Olympia, go visit the reading van in the library. I love how, how so many of us can imagine our childhood libraries and what books were where. This book features uh, some of your favorite characters of the Salish Sea. Um, that you see when you're sailing and swimming. What's your favorite creature in this book? And what was your favorite one to draw? And what is the, the name of a creature you have the most fun saying? That's a three-part question. <laughs> well, let me see. Okay, my favorite one in the book, I would say it's the lump suckers. And it might also just be all those things. <laughs> Though I've never seen a lump sucker in person in the wild. I've seen them in aquariums, but I've gone um, snorkeling off San Juan Island in some eelgrass and was always hoping to see the lump suckers, but they're pretty tiny and they're very, very well camouflaged. And that picture of the three lump suckers, um, I had taped to my wall this whole past year and it was really felt like our family, just like we're just hanging on here um, as this tide goes current is, you know, passes over us, all this tumult of the world that we're in, and we're just hanging on, just doing our best. So um, that one, um, also the stubby squid, which is what I start with, um, that, that creature too, I have never seen alive. There was one that washed ashore on this beach once, and it really led to a lot of speculations, like what is this strange creature? And uh, so a lot of those creatures in the book are actually my son's favorite creatures because when he was young there was we would spend a lot of time on the beaches and, and we would snorkel in the cold water and find lots of amazing things so it led to lots of questions lots of um, field guides um, to different marine animals and um, so we just did a lot of looking and thinking and exploring and so those were kind of when I thought of what to put in this book I put what his favorites were I was hoping you would say lump sucker. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, it's just a wonderful they're, image too. They're really cute. You should, there's lots of videos of lump suckers. People have them as, you know. What kind of art did you do as a child? And when did you start with the art of paper cutting? Um, and how did you learn? Well, my art as a child was, I just was constantly drawing and drawing and drawing from those squiggle games in the library to, you know, just, I would roll out giant, but giant roll of newspaper that you used to be able to get when there were printed, <laughs> newspapers being printed in every town. Um, and I would just draw giant landscapes and people scenes and just spend all day making these giant drawings. Um, and, you know, I was, yeah, I just kind of always, I feel like, but part of that is not just drawing, but I've always been a very observant person as a kid I would also be the person the kid that would just sit and watch ants all day long um, and just w try to understand what they were doing and where they were going and what their m motive for life was <laughs> I guess so I guess I've always just been very aware and observant of the world around me and expressing that through art um, was just a, sort of just was natural for me to do um, and then as far as paper cutting, I 
had been doing sort of scratch board and linoleum cuts, but that all takes this time. Like linoleum, you have to carve and then you have to ink and then print and everything you make is reverse. And the scratch board, you're scratching this thing all up and it's just kind of a, a mess when you're done. And at that time period too, technology, like you could make copies of things, but copies of scratch board quickly degrade of copy after copy after copy. And I just wanted something really bold and really sharp. And I had a friend who went to art school. I didn't go to art school. I just, I went to Evergreen State College, which is just right over on the other side of that shore. And I studied natural history. So I just was, you know, in the woods looking at everything and asking questions of everything and drawing pictures of them as well. But I didn't have, I don't have any art training other than just raw experience by now. Um, and he had gone to art school and he said, why don't you try paper cutting? And I had never even thought of that. And so I just sat down and I cut a picture out of black paper with an X-Acto knife. And it just was like, yeah, that's what I've been seeing in my head. That solves all those problems of reproduction and dis distribution. And, um, but it also just felt so vital. Like I could use, my knowledge of the natural world, like say what makes, you know, an apple leaf different from a peach leaf or an alder leaf and distill it down to the essence of that object of that leaf itself without being like, you know, I spend like a week drawing a fly or, you know, or several days drawing twig, like doing technical illustration styles and, but realizing what made that twig, that twig, wasn't necessarily all those little tiny dots I was throwing all over the place, but it was just the form and structure of it. And yeah, just getting to the essence of it. And so that really was both, you know, liberating, but here it is, you know, 30 years later, <laughs> it's actually October 2nd is the 30 year anniversary of my first book, my first, um, so, uh, and I'm still working in that medium, but one, two, three was, was really great because I added watercolor to it. So that was a, a different tack on that um, journey that I'm on. Thank you. Your work is so beautiful. Your prints, calendars, all of your books. You just mentioned your first book. Could you tell us a little bit about that and what brought you to creating books for young readers? Well, my first book that I made was Apple and I made it in whenever it was, maybe it isn't 30, maybe it's 25, 25, yeah, <laughs> 1996. Um, and that was, I had gone on a walk and I found a bunch of apples and I brought them home and I made a pie. And then I sat down and was like, I want to make a book and I want to make it now. I always wanted to make, make books. I always wanted to make kids books. I always wanted to, you know, make like blueberries for Sal because, you know, like that was like, I want to make that, you know, that's perfection of a book. Um, I have never gotten there. Um, I'm still striving, <laughs> but, um, you know, so it, it really was, I just gave myself permission. And I sat down and I made Apple and um, it, and I then went to a copy store and made copies and hand colored in the apples and started selling them and giving them away. And then that subsequently has gone published by Abrams, published um, that in hardbound and now in board book form. So, um, but without editing and changing, except we did add text. Yeah, that was all wordless when it came out. But, you know, as far as like what drove me to make that book was really the idea of, I want to make books for the kids here because all the books I had checked out in my library were from the East Coast the beaches of the East Coast where there's horseshoe crabs. Like those are just crazy things, right? Um, or blue crabs uh, or, you know, hurricanes, um, things like that, things that we don't have here. So I wanted to make books for the kids here, right here that live along these shores of this place and have it be things that they understood and knew. Waiting for High Tide and this book, One, Two, Three, Salish Sea, so perfectly capture everything of our area of Washington. So thank you for your work. Oh, yeah. It's wonderful. Thanks. I don't know if you can see the, the raft. 
in front of the boat. Can mm -hmm. you see that? That's yeah. the raft we built for waiting for high tide. Wow. <laughs> you can come swim off of it. <laughs> <if you dare. laughs> well, thank you. That is, it's been my aim to make place books for this place um, because it is so special. And, you know, it's the edge of the wilderness right there that we all live along. Um, and there's just remarkable creatures in there that we just pass by and don't think about at all. So, but they're all there. You thank you for your work and for sharing it with Washington's kids and and well beyond. I mean, they're global at this point. So, it's, uh, all right. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. And thank you, Representative Kilmer, too.